This week on CNET Tech Review, Mac OS X Lion arrives while Apple eats its young with the new MacBook Airs. We'll also show you how to upgrade the RAM on your iMac. Spotify helps you find the music your friends are listening to. Oh joy. And possibly the best real world 5.1 system we've ever tested can make it all sound great. That's all coming up right now. Hello folks, I'm Brian Cooley and welcome to the CNET Tech Review, where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, as well as offer our own special wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start off with the good. New this week on the laptop front was a pair of updates to Apple's MacBook Air lineup. These ultralights already had pretty darn impressive specs, but as our Dan Ackerman shows us, there's always room for a little improvement. I'm Dan Ackerman and we are here taking a very first look at the latest version of Apple's 13-inch MacBook Air. Now, physically from the outside, you open up the box, this looks a heck of a lot like uh, the previous uh, MacBook Air. And in fact, physically, it's pretty much the same box, except this guy has a backlit keyboard, something that was in the original Air, missing from the second generation, now back here again. And the other big changes, I'm going to show you right here on the side, this uh, DisplayPort jack right here in the back is now a Thunderbolt compatible uh, jack so that you can hook up a display to it, but you can also hook up Thunderbolt peripherals if you happen to run across any. There are a couple of hard drives, and Apple is going to have a really uh, nice looking big laptop uh, oriented monitor uh, later on in the summer that you can actually connect this directly to, and that's going to have an Ethernet port and a Firewire and some other jacks that through that single Thunderbolt connection you can all access from your laptop. Under the hood, the biggest change with this latest generation of MacBook Air systems is the move from Intel's Core 2 Duo CPUs to the latest second generation Core i series. That's a two generation leap for the processor. Uh, you've got Core i5 in the 11 inch and the 13 inch MacBooks, and in both of those, you can actually upgrade to the faster Core i7 processors. These are all the low voltage versions, and you've got to start with the more expensive upgrade upgraded base models for both of those in order to get that uh, Core i7 processor. As it is, just start out with a 128 gig solid state drive in the 13 inch uh, version and 4 gigs of RAM. You can upgrade that to a 256 gig solid state drive, which should be big enough for just about everybody. Uh, once you start doing that, uh, your MacBook Air can get a little bit expensive. We've still got the same uh, 16 by 10 display. They haven't moved to 16 by 9 yet on the 13 inch models. Uh, the big gigantic uh, multi-track touchpad is the same. They have, however, added for the OS X Lion uh, operating system upgrade that comes with this a bunch of new gestures that took us a little while to get used to, uh, but a bunch of them are actually pretty useful. And uh, you're going to have to uh, train yourself to use those instead of uh, some of the previous versions of these multi-touch gestures. So following the traditional Apple upgrade cycle, what they've done is they've kept the prices the same, $12.99 and $15.99 for the two different base models of the 13-inch MacBook Air while upgrading the components inside, most notably, of course, that Core i5 processor and the Thunderbolt port. I'm Dan Ackerman, and that is Apple's new 13-inch MacBook Air. Now, with the introduction of the new MacBook Airs, the basic 13-inch MacBook, the one that cost $9.99, quietly vanished. So these new Airs are now Apple's entry-level portable computers. If you're not convinced, check out Scott Stein's further impressions of the 11-inch model right now at CNETTV.com. Perhaps more important than the new hardware is the fact that OS X Lion was released into the wild on Wednesday, and our Jason Parker didn't waste any time before going after it. Hello everyone, Apple has finally unleashed the Lion. That's Mac OS X Lion, and it's available today at the Mac App Store. But is it worth the upgrade for everyone? I'm Jason Parker from CNET, and this is a first look at Apple's newest operating system, Mac OS X Lion. We had the chance to sit down and check out many of the new features, and we're impressed with what we've seen so far. To get started, multi-touch gestures figure prominently in Mac OS X Lion, letting you swipe, pinch, and tap your way through many of the operating system's newest features. For example, a three-finger swipe upwards brings up the new Mission Control, 
where you can see everything that's currently running, along with associated windows that have the running apps icon at the bottom. Simply click on any window to bring it to the front. As another example, in Safari you'll now be able to go back or forward through your history on a browser tab with a two-finger swipe. All of the multi-touch gestures feel very natural, and Apple says it's because they've added new, more responsive animations. Notice how you can swipe the Safari page exactly as much, or as little as you want. Mac OS X Lion now offers full-screen apps, a feature many Windows users have seen as a major disappointment in the Mac OS over the years. Now you can click on the diagonal arrows icon in the upper right corner of a window to quickly switch to full screen. Once in full screen, your three-finger horizontal swipe switches between full screen apps and desktops. Speaking of desktops, the Spaces feature has been elegantly worked into Mission Control as well. If you want to create a second desktop, just click and drag a window or set of windows to the icon at the upper right. Now, with a three-finger horizontal swipe, you'll be able to switch between open apps and newly created desktops. Oh, and also new to Lion, one further three-finger swipe to the right now gets you to the widget dashboard. It's no secret that iOS devices have been a huge success for Apple, and along with touchscreen features, some iOS interface elements snuck into Lion as well. Launchpad gives you another option for quickly showing all your apps, and it looks just like the way apps are laid out in the iOS. Bring up Launchpad by hitting the icon in the dock, or by doing a three-finger and thumb pinch motion. Just like the iPhone, you can click and hold an app to get into jiggle mode, then either move apps around or create folders by dropping an app on another app's icon. You still have the option to search for apps in the Finder, and still can create an application folder in the dock, but if you like that iOS look, Launchpad is the way to go. One of the biggest upgrades for Lion is one of the most important apps of all, Mail, Apple's email app. Now, the layout closely resembles the email experience on the iPad, with your message list on the left and message content on the right. The new Mail app now has a favorites bar for one-click access to your most used folders. You can still do it the old way if you want, however, by hitting the Show button in the upper left to bring up the standard folder structure. Also, just like iOS devices, you'll now be able to view message threads as conversations. A number next to the message shows how many messages have been sent in a conversation. Once clicked, each conversation shows separate boxes for each reply that's both nice looking and makes it less confusing to quickly read through. Searching email got a huge upgrade as well. Now when you type in a name, for example, Mail offers suggestions based on what's in your inbox. But even better, they created search tokens. When you click a suggestion, it creates a token. This way, you can refine your search by first creating a token of the name, then add a month, say, then a subject, and get only the mail that came from that person in that month and with that subject. This will make searching for that mystery email much easier than before. Apple also made it easier to share files with those nearby, where once you needed to email or send a file via chat client, you'll now be able to use AirDrop. Simply choose AirDrop from the Finder, and you'll be able to see nearby users where you can drag and drop a file to their avatar. We have one word for this, finally. Even though the Mac App Store was introduced as an update in Snow Leopard, it's important to talk about here because it's the only place you can buy and download Lion for $29.99. Unfortunately, this means that if you skipped over Snow Leopard, you'll still have to buy it for $29 in order to get the Mac App Store to download Lion. We can see why Apple did it this way, but frankly, it doesn't seem fair to those who chose not to buy Snow Leopard. Overall, Mac OS X Lion is a solid upgrade that comes with more than 250 new features. We can't list them all here, but be sure to check out our full review at download.com. This is Jason Parker for CNET. Thanks for watching our first look at Mac OS X Lion. See you next time. So, if you're all set to take on the upgrade, make sure to check out our how to section at CNET.com to find out how to prep your current Mac for a Lion install. You'll notice that Apple suggests at least two gigabytes of RAM. But as we all know, the more the better in that category. If you're sitting there staring at your iMac, though, wondering where does the RAM even go, David Carnoy has you covered. I'm David Carnoy from CNET. I'm going to show you how to upgrade the RAM on your iMac, which will definitely speed up your machine. really pretty simple and we recommend upgrading your RAM yourself because you can save a good bit of money by not ordering extra RAM from Apple when you initially purchase your iMac. The first thing to do is figure out just what iMac you have 
and check on Apple's website to figure out which model you have and what kind of RAM it takes and how much memory you can put into your machine. The last couple of years, the base configuration of the iMac has come with 4 gigabytes of RAM in two 2 gigabyte memory modules, which takes up two of the four memory slots in the iMac. To get to the memory compartment, you lay your iMac on a soft surface with the screen facing down. Then all you have to do is take a Phillips screwdriver and unscrew the three screws for the plate that covers the compartment on the bottom of the iMac, and you'll be able to find where your memory is hiding. As you can see here, we have two slots open for additional memory. This iMac, which is a 2011 model, accepts up to 16 gigabytes of RAM, adds to the 2010 models. What a lot of people do is keep the existing 2 gigabyte modules in place, then add an additional two 4 gigabyte models, bringing the total to 12 gigabytes. Alas, the modules only go up to 4 gigabytes, so if you want to get to the full 16 gigabytes, you have to replace your current 2 gigabyte modules with 4 gigabyte modules. That's probably not worth it for a lot of people, but as we said, you do save a lot of money by installing it yourself. For instance, to add an additional 8 gigabytes of RAM, Apple would charge you 200 bucks, while two 4 gigabyte modules of this Kingston memory that Kingston provided for this demo will run you around $70. Ridiculously, Apple charges $600 for a full 16 gigabyte upgrade when you can do the same install yourself for less than a third of the cost. To get the modules installed, you just slide them into the respective compartments and wait until you feel a little click that tells you it's snapped in place. To get an existing module out, you gently pull up on the ribbon and slide the new module in. That's really all there is to it. Once you've got your memory installed, you can put the plate back on and you should be good to go with a machine that feels noticeably zippier. I'm David Carnoy, and thanks for watching the CNET how-to video. Huh, from the looks of things, the RAM modules appear to be just about the only user serviceable part on a whole iMac. But any how-to that requires only a screwdriver and basic sobriety works for me. Okay, before this turns into one long version of Apple Byte, let's turn to our promised first look at the new Spotify music service. Donald Bell has a look at about the most awaited arrival from that side of the Atlantic since the Beatles. Hey, I'm Donald Bell, and today we're taking a long-awaited first look at Spotify, a free streaming music application for Mac and PC. Here's what all the fuss is about. After installing the software, Spotify pops up and shows you a hybrid of your computer's music collection and an online database full of songs and albums that you can stream at no cost. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet of unlimited music streams from both the majors and the indies living right alongside your personal music collection. So whether it's the Rolling Stones or some horrible new Kesha song, you can just type it in and you're immediately listening to full songs and albums. You can keep a record of your favorite tracks by giving them a star. You can also create playlists of your favorite tracks even if they're a mix of mp3s and songs from Spotify. Now what makes Spotify so viral is that it pulls in any friends from Facebook who are also using Spotify. From here, you can check out what they're listening to as well as their favorite tracks and playlists. On your end, you can manage what songs and playlists can be seen by others. Now if you find some great track and you want to shout it out to the world, you can also hit this share button and blast it out to all of your friends on Facebook, Twitter, or Messenger. That link will take them to the full song stream if they already have Spotify or it will prompt them to download the software. You get enough people sharing, and you can see how Spotify gets popular very quickly. So what's the catch? Well, ultimately, Spotify wants to get you on a paid account. Free users are granted six months of unlimited access to the entire Spotify catalog, but after that, Spotify will lay down some restrictions on how much you can stream. Free users will also have to put up some audio ads between tracks. Fortunately, Spotify isn't asking much from its paid subscribers. For $5 a month, you're back to unlimited playback on any computer, ad-free. For $10 a month, you also get the ability to cache your favorite tunes and playlists offline, plus you can use their mobile app, which can also cache your favorites for offline listening. All in all, it's a great service, and the free option is so compelling, it's hard not to recommend. It's addictive, though, so if you don't have an afternoon to kill listening to great music, you should save it for another day. For CNET.com, I'm Donald Bell. Sure, Spotify is only free for six months, but don't worry, by then there'll surely be a brand new must-have sharing service to take its place. Now, while I go beg Donald for a Spotify invite, 
Let's take a quick break, but don't go too far. We still got a lot more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on now with the good. The folks from Klipsch are probably still devising ways to put sugar in Matt Muscoviak's gas tank after we put their HD Theater 500 speaker system in the bad section last week. Well, Matt's back this week with the Energy Take Classic 5.1 speaker system, to which he has a completely different reaction. Hey, I'm Matthew Muscoviak at CNET.com, and this is the Energy Take Classic 5.1. This is a 5.1 speaker system, and it can be found online for $400. The Take Classic is one of the best home audio values you're going to find. The system is made up of four compact satellite speakers, a center channel, and a 200-watt subwoofer. The speakers have an elegant piano black finish, and overall the system looks like it costs a lot more than it actually does. Behind the speaker grill, you'll find a 0.75 inch tweeter and a 3 inch mid range driver. Around back, the speakers have high quality binding posts, so you'll be able to use banana plugs with your speaker wire. The subwoofer has an 8 inch driver on the bottom and standard connectivity options on the back panel. What makes the Take Classic system stand out from other compact speakers is its outstanding sound quality. The speakers are small, but it sounds like a big system, which means you can crank it up loud on movies and the energy delivers a powerful sound without getting distorted. The blend between the subwoofer and the satellite speakers is superb, and this is really one of the best compact subs you're going to find, which is a big reason why the system sounds so good. The Take Classic also sounds excellent with two-channel music, which is rare with a budget system like this. We used the Take Classic as our reference speakers when we were reviewing several other budget speaker packages, and the energies always came out on top, with the sole exception of Pioneer's SP PK 21BS speaker package. The Pioneer does sound a little better at high volumes, but those speakers are much larger, and that won't be a good choice for many living rooms. When you consider its excellent compact design, outstanding sound quality, and the incredible price, it's really tough to recommend anything other than Energy System. That's why the Energy Take Classic 5.1 is our editor's choice for budget speaker systems, and at $400, it's an incredible value. I'm Matthew Muscoviak, and this is the Energy Take Classic 5.1. So there you go. Great design, great sound, great value. One problem, energy take. Wow, that's a stupid name. Okay, let's see who we're going to knock down a peg this week as we move to the bad. When it comes to buying a smartphone, you don't have to spend a lot of money. But while there is such a thing as an entry-level phone, there's also such a thing as a do-not-enter model, as we're about to find out. I'm Jessica Dahlcourt for CNET. What I've got here today is the Huawei M835 for Metro PCS. It's also known as the T-Mobile Comet and the Huawei Ideo, so if it looks a little familiar to you, that's why. This is quite an entry-level phone. It runs Android 2.2 Froyo, but it does not have hotspot support. That's pretty normal for this type of phone and also for phones that run on prepaid carriers. I really like that it's running stock Android because the screen is really small, so the less clutter you've got on here, the better. It's got a 2.8 inch QVGA screen. This is, again, as I said, really small, and that's where swipe comes in handy because hunting and pecking on this really just won't work. The phone itself is also very compact. It's got a black face on the front that's shiny and glossy and a soft touch material on the back. It seems a little bit thick, and instinctively I keep thinking that there's going to be a slide-out QWERTY keyboard, but there's not. There's a 3.2 megapixel camera on the back. I thought that the pictures it took were washed out and kind of unfocused. Same for video, so that's unfortunate. There's a micro SD card slot that takes up to 32 gigabytes of external storage, but you do have to remove the battery to get at it, and that's a downside. On top of all of these drawbacks, the processor is also really slow, and it only has 2.5G data, so it feels really pokey overall. Call quality, also not so hot. 
So things aren't looking too good for this phone, and pricing may be its only saving grace. Right now, it's $80 with a $50 instant savings, and there's no contract with Metro PCS. So that makes it one of the most affordable Android phones for the carrier, but for about $20 more, you can also pick up the LG Optimus M, which I think is a better phone overall. So again, this is the Huawei M835, and you can check out my full review, all the pros and cons, at CNET.com. You see, there's a reason that Apple spends billions on R&D, and Huawei apparently spent eh, about a weekend. Let's finish things up with this week's bottom line. Thursday marked the official opening of Comic-Con 2011 in San Diego. Now, since Molly's on vacation this week, she won't be there costumed as Wonder Woman. Neither will Brian Tong, though I'd pay to see that. But he is there like the Pied Piper of pop culture. By the power of CNET, I have the power! Brian Tong here with CNET.com at Comic-Con 2011 here in San Diego. This is day one. You can see everyone streaming behind me. They're here for all the comics, the movies, the TV shows, the costumes, the toys, so much more. So we're going to go to the show floor and check it all out. You're really committing with this makeup. What inspired you? Uh, it was actually more of uh, people asked me to do it for the year, so I was like, all right, why not? It's Comic-Con, you know. Most excited for True Blood, except I'm kind of sad because my favorite character isn't going to be here. Eric? <sighs> the ladies like it's him. It's okay, though. Yeah. What brings you here to Comic-Con? Oh, really? The ladies? You're going to find a droid like that? All right, we have a family of superheroes here, and guys, what brings you out to Comic-Con? It's just, it's so much fun dressing up and just being around everybody and we love looking at all the exhibits and seeing all the different halls and seeing what's going on. Well, you know, the only person here with leggings is... Uh, <laughs> Superman. <laughs> they told me I had to. The Christmas present from my dad was the ticket to Comic-Con. What are you the most excited about to see here at, at Comic-Con? Um, hmm. I, I'm going to say probably The Amazing Spider-Man if I can get in tomorrow. <laughs> Go to Comic-Con, we know there's a lot of comic books and artwork, but collectibles are a big thing here. We're at the Alex Ross booth, one of the most legendary comic book artists here. And look, these are original works of his. We're talking about stuff in the $7,000, $8,000 range. And if you want to get real spicy, look at the Joker, 25 k You're here waiting. What are you looking to get here? Well, I'm going to get some, uh, some G.I. Joe Transformers, maybe, you know, Thor. Now look at this list. They have a little shopping cart, a checklist here, but these are exclusive toys to Comic-Con, right? Yes. Are you going to open them up and play with them or no, are you going to keep them no, in their packaging? No, they're going to stay in the package. Now you guys came here all the way from Hawaii for Comic-Con? Yes. 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 I've been coming here for, oh my gosh, I think since, I want to say 93. Woo. And yeah, it's, it, I mean, even though it Comic-Con has grown immensely, it's still really worth it coming. How does it feel to be a grown man waiting in line for toys? Feels great. I'm like the I'm Peter Pan man, the boy who never grew up. Now guys, the number one thing you have to have when you come to Comic Con, you need this big swag bag. It's almost as big as me, but I could see it. Use a little over the shoulder merce, doubled up. We got like some backpack action going on like that. I'm sure we could find plenty of uses for this thing. Dude, this is like the greatest place I've ever been. Yeah, even look look over there with all the Legos. You wanna go over there? I have the lovely Conan ladies here with me. Hi. <laughs> We're actually barbarian slave girls. Barbarian slave girls. Yes. Now, you know what that means, right? Oh, I know what that means. <laughs> uh, uh. Joey, tell me the story about this. What's up? All right, I've played uh, Gear since it first came out. Fell in love with it. Uh, they made 100 of these for 100 bucks. Third to last one. Now I'm going to be carrying on my shoulders for the next three hours. <laughs> it just you got, you got a little caught up in the hype of these collectibles, right? It I, happens. I, I try not to. I gave my girlfriend a lecture the last two days about buying vinyl nations from Disney. It's, how are you going uh, to explain this to her when the whole point was don't, don't fall for the trap? Oh, it's my birthday in like four days, so it's a birthday gift to myself. 
Star Wars is releasing their entire collection on Blu-ray sometime this fall. And what's exciting about this is we have a lot of cool displays like this museum replica. They've had been able to get the reference models of the actual costumes, then use things like the same materials, the same accessories. Here we have the Emperor. They're showcasing Luke Skywalker's digs, as well as Princess Leia's lovely white gown. But this is some of the cool and killer stuff that you'll find here all over the show floor in celebration of Star Wars Blu-ray release. All right, guys, you know, I'm a big roller, and right next to me, we're looking at over $1 million worth of comics. Captain America, Superman, Batman, you know how we do it. So tell us what you got right here. Uh, basic Comic-Con, uh, it's a book on a documentary on last year's Comic-Con, uh, done by Morgan Spurlock. And signed by the Stan great Lee. Stan Lee. Hey, man, uh, how's it hanging? Inspired by all these superheroes at Comic-Con, I have one last idea for this swag bag, and it's... Okay, let's try this. Oh, oh, that was a bad idea. Oh, for CNET.com. I'm Brian Tong from the show floor. Oh, literally, and uh, just watch all our videos and more. Oh, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> so the bottom line this week, better him than me. Standing here in this studio is about as close as I want to get to all those grown men lined up for action figures. I'm just nervous about where that goes. To experience even more of Comic-Con from a comfortable distance, be sure to keep your browser pointed at CNET all weekend long. All right, folks, that's our show for this time. Come back next week for an all-new CNET Tech Review. And until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. We'll see you here next time, and thank you for watching.